Our Father, we thank you for your grace to us, your goodness, the provision of salvation, the blessings that you give us every day. Thank you that we can meet here and sing your praises and worship thee. We pray that the word of God might be profitable in each heart here this day. We pray, Father, for those who are laid aside with illness. Lord, just watch over them and strengthen and restore them. We pray for our missionaries as they labor in difficult places. Pray for the Virgils there in South America. Bless their ministry and encourage them in, in their work there. And I pray that you help each one of us to be effective minis- uh, witnesses for Jesus Christ. We pray that you might watch over our nation in these uh, confusing times, these difficult days in the world. Lord, turn hearts to thee. Help people to see that, uh, uh, that there is a need for God in their lives. God who will watch over them and give his grace to them. We pray that you might bless us now and teach us by your Holy Spirit. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're in the midst of a little series on some of the basics of Christian living. Some of the basic things that are important in a Christian life. And, of course, the first one is you have to really be a Christian. You're not a Christian because you think you are. You're a Christian only because there was a time when God did a work in your heart, forgave your sins, uh, put his Holy Spirit within you, gave you the gift of eternal life. You were born again. You were converted. Uh, That is, God did a work in your heart and saved you. I hope you know that. Maybe you don't this morning. Uh, If not, that's the first step. Nothing else counts without that. And you need to turn to Christ and let him uh, give you, call upon him to give you the gift of eternal life. Confess your sins to him and admit that he is the one you need as your savior. That's the first step, salvation. Be sure you have it. If you don't, uh, you shouldn't give any rest or any peace to your heart until you do. And then uh, the next Sunday, we talked about spending time with the Lord every day. I hope you're doing that. Uh, five, ten minutes, fifteen minutes, whatever you have, every day, time to read your Bible, pray, and thank God and ask Him for His guidance in your life. Every day, uh, spend time with the Lord. That's the second basic. Uh, last week was another one of these basics, and that is the way you talk. Now, we who know the Lord as our Savior ought to talk like Christians, and sometimes we fail in that area. And our talk is unkind, or improper, or crude, or mean, or whatever else. And that shouldn't be. Our speech should always be with grace, seasoned with salt, it says in the scripture. And so our speech, that's what we talked about last week. Now this uh, this morning, we come to another area, and that is uh, the music we listen to. The title in your bulletin says, what kind of music do you like? Well, there are a lot of kinds of music. There's uh, classical music, there's folk music, there's country music, there's uh, rock music, there's uh, classical music, there's... Uh, gospel music, there's uh, Christian music, there's contemporary Christian music, many kinds of music. Uh, What kinds do you like? Well, we want to talk about that this morning. Imagine an older couple from some small town little church out there in the country somewhere, and they make a visit to the city. They go to the city, spend the weekend there with some relatives, come back home, and the neighbors say, well, how was your trip to the city? Oh, it was good. We had a good trip there. Well, how was the church there? Did you go to church? Oh, yeah, I went to a church there. How was it? Well, it was okay, but uh, we didn't like that new music. What do they mean? New music. Uh, is music bad because it's new? Well, all music was new once, you know. When Martin Luther first sang, uh, Martin Luther's, uh, not Martin Luther, but in Martin Luther's day, uh, when uh, Franz Gruber sang Silent Night for the first time on that Christmas Eve, that was the first time, it it was new music, first time it had ever been sung. And all music has its beginning. And, And these folk didn't really mean they didn't like new music. What they meant was they didn't like a new kind of music. And there's a difference. A new kind of music. Now, the kind of music you listen to affects your life. It affects your philosophy. It affects your doctrine. It affects the way you live. And it affects your Christian life. The music you like is an expression of your soul. 
As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. The music that comes from your lips reflects what is in your heart. And when we refer to a new kind of music nowadays, we're referring to what's known as contemporary Christian music. Because that's a long phrase, we say CCM, contemporary Christian music. And contemporary music is taking over the music of Christianity in this country and not only here, but all around the world. I suppose I can, can't prove this, I could only speculate and guess, but I would suppose 90% of the music, Christian music in America today is contemporary Christian music. That's a big piece, 90%, I believe that to be true. Uh, Contemporary Christian music started to get popular back in the 1960s. And now, 45 years later, 40 years later, it's the normal, average kind of music used in most churches, evangelical churches in this country. And contemporary Christian music is the greatest danger that American Christianity defaces. Contemporary Christian music weakens Christians. It muddles the gospel. It minimizes sound doctrine. It disparages the biblical doctrine of separation. It promotes a worldly and carnal Christianity. It closes down Sunday evening services and prayer meetings. It destroys churches. And you can see this all across the country. Now there are some churches who use contemporary Christian music and it looks like they are succeeding. But there's a far greater number of churches that have been destroyed than have the appearance of success. And so continue, consider the subject with me a little bit this morning. And uh, you have a sheet there you can jot some notes down on. And first of all, a definition of contemporary Christian music. What are we talking about? Well, you can define it many ways, but I'll boil it down to the simple. Uh, and that is basically contemporary Christian music is worldly music. That is the music of the world with some Christian words sprinkled in. That's it. Worldly Christian music with some Christian words sprinkled in. That's contemporary Christian music. Now, the two distinctive characteristics of this music are these, its style and its source. And so let me just uh, talk about those two things a minute. Style, the style of contemporary Christian music is basically the style of rock music. You know, what is rock music? You say, oh, that's music that's loud. And no, that's not, it may be loud, but that's not the defining characteristic of rock music. Uh, rock music first was made popular back in the days of Elvis Presley and the Beatles. They were the real beginners of it, uh, the popularizers of it in this country and the world. Elvis Presley and the Beatles. Now, Elvis Presley was when he first came on television, the television cameras would not show him below the waist because they said, not Christians, but the television industry said it was too vulgar to show him below the waist when he was performing his music. That's one of the founders uh, or popularizers of rock music. And the other one was the Beatles, uh, who said that they were just as important as God. That was their attitude. Uh, now, those were the original popularizers of rock music, uh, but that wasn't the distinguishing characteristic of it. Uh, the distinguishing characteristic of rock music is the beat. Now, all music has rhythm, and there's a natural beat and an unnatural beat. Now, uh, we never do things like this in Sunday morning service. But we're going to anyway. Jeff, you'd come to the piano and help us a little bit. Now, just to demonstrate that music has rhythm, that is a beat, if you want to call it a beat, it has rhythm. And I want you to just, again, we don't do this sort of thing, but uh, this morning we're going to do it anyway. 
clap our hands to the, we're only gonna sing a line or two, clap your hands to the music. Now I'm not gonna tell you when to clap or where to clap. We're not gonna clap every single note like that, but every couple of notes or so, clap to the music. And I'm not gonna show you, I'm not gonna tell you, but you clap what you think is in time to the music. And we're gonna sing a song. You got your clappers ready now? You gotta get your pencils out of your hands so you can clap now. Uh, we're gonna sing just the first line. I'm gonna sing, you can sing along with me, that'll be fine. Onward Christian Soldiers, all right? Uh, just give us a chord. All right, that's, that's where we're gonna start, all right? Now, get ready, ready? Now clap in time to the music, here we go. Onward Christian Soldiers Marching as to war. All right. Now, everybody was clapping at the same time. That's interesting. Uh, now, uh, let's sing another song. Maybe not as familiar, but most of you know it. My hope is in the Lord. My hope is in the Lord. My hope is in the Lord. Give us a chord again, Jeff. All right, and clap to the music now in time. Ready, here we go. My hope is in the Lord who gave himself for me. All right, now, thank you. Now, now that was an interesting experiment. I didn't tell you when to clap. Nobody else did. I hope you didn't look at somebody else. But you clapped in time to the music. And you knew where the first beat was. How did you, now the first song we sang was Onward Christian. Now, the second song was just My Hope Is. Now both of those were on really the first beat, but nobody told you that. You didn't have your songbook to look at, but still you clapped the right way. Now, uh, Onward Christian Soldiers, that's a song you march to. Many songs are in march time. And uh, when you march, I just want to show you a little bit, thanks, Jeff, uh, about human nature. When you march, you say you're an army. And when you march, which foot goes first? All right. OK, there's some confusion on that subject. But uh, when the army, the sergeant calls out cadence, left, right, left, right. Right? That's the way it is in the army. And I think, uh, I don't know all the armies in the world, but I think all the armies in the world have always started with their left foot. Now, why is that? Uh, well, it's interesting. <laughs> little uh, etymological background there. The left foot. Now, uh, back in olden times, they used to think the word left, in whatever language it was, was kind of a, a bad luck word. It was a word that had bad connotations, negative connotations, kind of bad luck word. And so they didn't like to say the left foot. So they would say the, uh, in the Greek language, uh, the euonamus foot, uh, which means namus, the name, and you, the good, the good name foot. The good name foot, the left foot. They wouldn't call it left foot, that wasn't a good name. Uh, but they called it the good name foot. And it was the left foot. Now, uh, in a poem by Ru Rudyard Kipling, uh, he wrote about the armies in India during the glory days of England. And he had a famous poem called The Grand Trunk Road, which was very interesting. The English army would be marching down the road. And uh, in that country in those days, still for that matter, they'd have these old uh, bullock carts, an ox cart going down the road, and when the army was coming, since the British were running the country, everybody's supposed to get out of the road. So he wrote this poem. It said, get you off, you bullock man. You hear the trumpet blowed. There's a regiment a coming down the Grand Trunk Road with the best foot first, and the fields are gliding past and every blooming camping ground exactly as the last. Well, it's in the best foot, the left foot. Uh, there, uh, what I'm saying is this. There's a sense within us that God has built within everybody of natural rhythm. And the natural rhythm is one, two, one, two, or one, two, three, four. And that's the rhythm that you clapped this morning as you did that. In other words, the, the main beat, the left, right, left, right, 
and those are the beats that get the accent, the first and the third beat, or the first beat, depending on the time it's in. Uh, now, in music, the normal, natural beat is the strongest beat is the first beat, and the second strongest beat is the third beat. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, left, right, left, right. That's natural rhythm. Now, that's nature. That's the way God builds. Nobody has to teach you. Nobody has to figure it out for you. That's built within. Now, rock music has a different kind of beat. In rock music, the emphasis is never on the first beat and the third beat. It's on the second beat and the fourth beat. It changes the whole natural system from the first beat, third beat, to the second beat. In other words, instead of one, two, three, four, it's one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Left, right, left, right. And maybe that doesn't sound like much to you or what's the difference, but you examine rock music and you find that all through rock music, the heavy beat, the basic beat, the basic ingredient is that heavy beat on the, what we would call in music, the off beat, the other beat, the, the wrong beat. And what happens is when you have the beat the wrong way, it does something to your emotional system. And it does something that appeals to the old sinful nature. And it appeals to the nature contrary to the way God made us. And the basic ingredient of Christian contemporary music is the rock rhythm. Now I know I'm having to simplify some of these things a little bit, if you're a great music student. Uh, but uh, this is basically it. The basic ingredient of Christian contemporary music is the rock beat, the rock rhythm. In fact, you couldn't have Christian contemporary music without it. You couldn't have CCM without the rock beat any more than you could have a choir without singers. Just wouldn't work. And so the basic rhythm of contemporary Christian music is contrary to nature. And it's appealing to the old sinful nature and against God and his plan. Now the rhythm from uh, the rhythm in CCM and in rock music, because they're both in the same category, the rhythm comes basically from the drums. Because you have to emphasize that beat. Now sometimes they use another instrument like a bass viol or something, but mostly it's the drums, the drums, the drums. Uh, what's the first thing you see in a church that decides to adopt contemporary Christian music. The first thing you see is the drums appear on the platform. The drums. Now, uh, David was a great musician. He organized choirs and orchestras. He wrote songs. He wrote music. And David mentioned many instruments. The psaltery and the harp and the dulcimer and the flute and all kinds of instruments. Uh, he mentioned many instruments, but he never mentioned drums. Now, take your Bibles and turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 23. 2 Kings chapter 23. Here we find a king named Josiah, and he was the kingdom of Judah was in a mess, bad shape, far from God, and he was getting things reformed and back on track. And among the things which he did, we find this in 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 10, as Josiah is reforming the kingdom, straightening things out, getting rid of evil. It says in verse 10, 2 Kings 23, 10, he defiled Tophet, which is in the valley of the children of Hinnom, that no man might make his son or his daughter pass through the fire to Molech. Now this is a re reference to an awful custom. In the idolatrous Baal worship of the Canaanites, they would offer as a sacrifice, a live sacrifice, their firstborn babies. And uh, in Josiah's day, they did that 
in the Valley of Hinnom. That was kind of the, the valley outside of Jerusalem. And it was kind of where the garbage dump was, where they'd throw the garbage and they would burn it. Uh, but there also they would have this big idol of Baal and they would take their firstborn babies and the uh, idol of Baal at that place would be filled with burning fire and they would throw their babies into that idol. Awful thing. God is always concerned for little children, the infants, the babies. And here they were taking the babies that God had given them and they were offering them as a live sacrifice to Baal. And of course, as the babies were cast into that fire, uh, the screams would be awful and what an effect that would have on the mothers. But they tried to alleviate that by getting the drums. And so as the babies were thrown into the idol of the fire of that idol, they would have the drums rolling at full pitch so they could, so the screams of the babies wouldn't be heard. And Josiah said, we've got to get rid of this awful practice. He defiled uh, the idol, he destroyed it, he burned it, burnt bones on it and everything else uh, so that it wasn't fit in their thinking for idol worship anymore. And it's referred to as uh, he defiled Tophet. Now the word Tophet, it comes from the Hebrew word which means beating, which is the drums. It was the valley of drums where they would sound the drums. And that's the only way the word drums is used in the Old Testament. The drums which they played for the idol worship of Baal. And uh, so originally, the drums were used as an instrument of idolatry. And if you trace down the various forms of heathen idolatrous worship in this world today, you would still find the drums are prevalent. In demon possession, as they do in Burma, they have little uh, things over there, they uh, uh, call them che, where they go on all night, drunkenness, and playing the drums, beating the drums, until the demons start to possess people and people become demon possessed. And so drums have always been connected with idolatry. Now that doesn't mean you can never use drum. There's a place for drums, uh, marching in the army and things like that. Uh, uh, but the uh, common use was always in idolatry. You can use drums in an orchestra sometimes now and then, things like that, just like uh, alcohol. What's the common use of alcohol? To make people drunk. But there are some good uses of alcohol. You can use it to, uh, they use it in medical uh, practices to sterilize instruments and things. Uh, so even some things that are commonly used for bad can sometimes be used for good. Uh, but the common use of the drums was for idolatry uh, and has been all down through the years. Now drums are basic to the beat of Christian contemporary music. Uh, if you would take away the drums, disaster to their music. Now you could take away any other, you can have con contemporary Christian music without violins, you can have Christian contemporary music without pianos, you can have Christian contemporary music without uh, trumpets, but you can't have contemporary Christian music without drums. So then, any Christian should ask, if contemporary Christian music is based on drums, and the primary use of drums was an idol worship, then why should we use contemporary Christian music? That would be a good question. And I don't know that there's any answer to that. Now, uh, so uh, one source of contemporary Christian music is the rhythm. And the second source of it is worldliness. Worldliness. Now, Christian contemporary music began with people who wanted to appeal to the world. Say, so, oh, all these unsaved people out there, and they don't like our old church music, <clears throat> but we want them to be saved, so we will use their music, and they will like it, and then they will come to church and be saved. And so in not too far back, the common custom was some young people to get together a, a Christian rock band, and they would uh, uh, use it uh, to appeal to people. And uh, they said, oh, the young people really like this. And it's true, young people often do. 
Uh, but what they really like is the, is the worldliness of contemporary Christian music. It appeals to the old, carnal, sinful, worldly nature. Now, there are four aspects of, wor of worldliness in CCM, and I'd like to list them for you, jot down. First of all, it comes from the world. Uh, contemporary Christian music, that kind of music, rock music was not invented by Christians. Uh, the style, the beat, began with the unsaved entertainment world, the godless entertainment world, the godless rock stars and heathen idolatries. And uh, in those days, uh, some young people were saved, always have been. And uh, they said, oh, but we don't want to give up our music. And this old church music doesn't appeal to us and won't appeal to any of our friends either. So uh, we want to bring in our music that we are used to as unsaved young people. We want to bring that into our new religion. We've accepted Christianity, but we want to bring our old worldly music along with us. Now, if you get water out of a polluted well and put it in a silver goblet, it's still polluted water. And if you take polluted music and sprinkle a few Christian words in it, it's still polluted music. Uh, the music of the sim uh, uh, CCM is the music of the sinful world sprinkled with Christian words. And playing it in church doesn't make it good. It comes from the world. That's the source. Secondly, a CCM Christian contemporary music looks like the world. Now you look at their posters and their pictures, same type pictures the world uses, dress styles the same, hairstyles the same, uh, names, same as the godless rock stars, maybe a little more modest, but not a whole lot, still like the world. And I went on the uh, internet the other day and, and said, let me look at the names of Christian rock groups. And their names were interesting. Here's some of their names. Striper, Blackguard, Die Happy. These, are, these aren't worldly rock groups. These are Christian, contemporary Christian groups. Striper, Blackguard, Die Happy, Arsenal, Fighter, Rez, Mastodon, Legend, Bride, Last Days, and things like that. The list goes on. Now, those are the same names. Could be used by any worldly rock group. No difference. And why would they use those kind of names? Why those? Because those are the kind of names that the heathen world uses. And to appeal to the world, we have to be like the world. That's the philosophy of contemporary Christian music. We want to look like the world. And thirdly, it sounds like the world. Now I can prove this to you. If you take your radio, turn on the FM dial, most of the FM stations, a good bit of the time are just playing rock music, and you turn your dial from one rock station to another, go down, and as you do that, you pass the moody radio signal and if you don't catch the words, you couldn't tell the difference between their music and secular, worldly rock music. Couldn't tell the difference. And uh, you test it out if you don't believe me. Now, if you catch the words, you might figure it out after a while, but the music is exactly the same. You can't tell the difference. In fact, a good bit of time, it's a little bit louder and wilder there than on the secular rock stations. Uh, but the point is, it sounds like the world. And fourthly, it appeals to the world. Now, years ago, the method was this. Uh, some young people get together a Christian rock band and say, we want, to reach our, we want to reach other young people. So they'd go to a high school and put on a rock concert, get permission, put on a rock concert as a school, uh, school program, put on a rock concert. And then they'd say, now you all come back tonight and we'll have another rock concert. And so many of the students come back that evening. And then they'd play some rock music, and then they'd play some Christian rock music, and then they'd give a little message. And they say, oh, see, this is the way. We will use the rock music of the world to attract people to the gospel. And they will come because it appeals to them. It appeals to the world. 
They like it. Now, is something right because we like it? If you ask many young people, Christian young people, why do you, why do you listen to CCM music? They say, because we like it. Eve, in the garden, she liked the fruit, and she gave it to her husband. But it was still wrong. Uh, the alcoholic likes his drink, but it's still wrong. The immoral person enjoys his immorality, but it's still wrong. The gambler enjoys his gambling, but it's still wrong. Something isn't right because we like it. And so, you see, Christian contemporary music, it comes from the world, it looks like the world, it sounds like the world, it appeals to the world. Now there's, you know, the old saying, if it looks like a duck and sounds like a duck and walks like a duck, it's probably a duck. And that's true. And uh, so if Christian contemporary music looks like the world, sounds like the world, acts like the world, well, that's because it's worldly. The reason both unsaved and Christians like CCM is because they love the world. Take your Bibles now and turn with me to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. 1 John 2, 15. God says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Now, it doesn't take shouldn't take much understanding, teaching, or explanation, or anything else to convince you that rock music is worldly. And God says the reason people like it is because they love the world. And the problem is, if you love the world, you don't really love God. Now, I didn't say that. that God's, that's what God says. And then, if you turn back to Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Paul says this, simple statement. And be not conformed to this world. Don't be shaped like this world. Don't look like, act like, talk like this world. And yet the whole theory, the whole rationale for contemporary Christian music is we want to be like the world, so we can get the world to listen to us, so we can win the Lord of the Savior. Now, just because something has a good goal, that doesn't make it right either. And it doesn't make it right to disobey the Scripture in order to think that somehow you're going to get someone saved by doing it. Really, they're not concerned about getting people saved. They're concerned about having music they enjoy. And what they enjoy is their carnal nature enjoys the music of the carnal world. Now, thirdly, let me list briefly for you, how do you recognize CCM? How do you really know what it is? You say, oh, I don't know much about music. How do you recognize it? Well, let me give you some simple things. First of all, the beat. Emphasis on the rock rhythm. That's always there. It might uh, blur it for a few phrases once in a while, but it'll come right back to it, the rock beat. Secondly, the drums. They're invariably there. Maybe once in a thousand pieces you'll hear one that doesn't have drums on. I've never heard one, but there might be one somewhere. But basically, the drums, that's a dead giveaway. Uh, thirdly, there's an unsingable, I don't know if that's a word or not, but uh, a melody you can't sing, an unsingable melody. Why don't you see rock music, Christian contemporary music written out so people in churches can sing it? Because you can't hardly sing that stuff unless you're really practiced at it. And you can't follow it, and you can't learn it. And uh, most of the crowd uh, can't sing that kind of music. That's why it's not given to congregational singing. No, it's a little group up there, or an individual, a soloist, and they can sing it somehow. But uh, almost always it's mainly solo work, maybe a little choral background, but it's solo work, because uh, the melodies are basically practically unsingable, not easy to sing at all. 
A fourth characteristic, often meaningless words. Meaningless words. I uh, listened to a little bit, a few snatches this week, just so I could get up to date on what's going on. And, and I turned on one song, and it said something like, uh, praise the Lord 50 times in one song. Not much other words there. Now, nothing wrong with praising the Lord, but we, when it just becomes an a uh, meaningless phrase, just repeating something over and over again, a little doctrine, uh, but the emphasis of CCM is not on doctrine, but really on sentimental experience. Something like this. I went through the dark valley, but I felt that Jesus was near. That would be uh, the, uh, an example of the emphasis of CCM. C contrast that to a good song of our hymn books in the same subject. When through the deep valleys my pathway shall lie, thy grace all sufficient shall be my supply. Now there's a whole lot of difference between the two. And uh, so rock music is often meaningless words. Number five, emphasis on performance, not ministry. Uh, People just can't sing Christian contemporary music. They have to, uh, they have to put on performances and put on concerts and say nice things about God so people will think it's religious. Uh, but uh, they build a following, each of these CCM groups. They want a following, they put out their posters, they hire their advertising agents. You don't believe it, just look on the network. You can find whole places where you can get your CCM group advertised and promoted and uh, gotten on radio stations and so on. And uh, just becomes a professional thing. They're performers, they're artists. They're not ministers of God. Uh, was Paul ever a Christian artist? don't recall I read of that anywhere. And, and many of these CCM stars, they call them, uh, go into what they call crossover. That is, uh, they get so good at Christian rock that they cross over and say, well, let's just do ordinary rock, secular rock, because you get more famous and more money that way, so they just cross over and do that. And uh, why do they clap at all these concerts and cheer? Because they're cheering the performer. They're not glorifying God. They're cheering the artists, the performers. And I would rather listen anytime to one of our simple musicians stand up and sing from their heart and turn hearts to God rather that than any of these CCM artist crowds who are mostly out to make a dollar and make fame for themselves. Um, the sixth identifying characteristic is the sensual sound. The sensual sound, you listen to them sing, they sing just like the world's recording artists. Not simple and clear, but throaty and whispering and sliding around. Uh, many of them, their voices would make a singing prostitute proud. And then, I think one of the big things not often mentioned is the emotional stress. Most CCM music starts with a bang and crash at full volume and then works its way up from there. Uh, and what that does, the emotional frenzy, the driving force of that music, it winds up the whole emotional and physical system, winds them up tight. And it keeps getting louder and faster and higher. And you listen to much of that and it'll have about the same effect on you as 20 Cokes and 10 cups of strong coffee in one day. Do about the same thing to you. And that's not even healthy. Well then, number four, uh, why do churches use this kind of music? Why do churches use it? It's worldly. It comes from pagan sources. It's conformed to the world. Why do they use it? Well, number one, they say we can reach the lost for Jesus. Now that doesn't happen very often. Uh, and the end doesn't justify the means. Nothing is right because it works. No, that's not the reason. That's just an excuse to use worldly music. Second reason, they say, well, everybody else does. 
Everybody else does. That's what Willow Creek does. That's what Moody does. That's what most of the other churches do. But you know, in God's program, right or wrong, is never determined by a majority vote. Amen. And uh, just because everybody does it, one person does it, many people does it, or everybody does it, that doesn't make it right. Right is determined by scriptural principles, not what other people do. And a third reason I think they do it is basically they're just brainwashed, many people. That's all they hear. That's what everybody else does. They're told, them that's, uh, they're told that's the way to reach the world. And so they said, well, it must be okay then. And they're just kind of brainwashed and go along with the program. The real reason is number four. That is, churches use it because we like it. The young people like it. Well, there's a reason for that. That's because people are carnal. That's because people love the world. That's because people are conformed to the world. They like it. It appeals to the flesh. It appeals to the old sinful nature. The proponents of CCM give every reason except the real one. The real one, their old sinful nature likes it. So the question is, what kind of music do you listen to? Maybe you've never thought about it before. But do you listen to whatever is on the radio? If you do, you're listening to CCM. Do you say, well, I listen to it because I like it. That doesn't make it right. Maybe you say, what difference does it make? The music is not neutral. They'll all tell you music is neutral. It's not neutral. It produces something. It produces something like itself. Carnal, worldly music, by some mysterious reason, produces carnal, worldly Christians. And uh, the scripture says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And if you fill your mind and your heart with CCM music, you're going to be a carnal and worldly person. But we are not, if we're followers of God, we're not supposed to be on the world side. If a ball team, supposing our boys basketball team, I said, now what we're going to do this year is we're going to do a whole bunch of different colored uniforms. And whatever the other team is wearing, if they're wearing blue jerseys, we'll wear blue jerseys. If they're wearing red jerseys, we'll wear red jerseys. Because that way, uh, they won't know who's on which side, and we can get more baskets that way. Now, of course, that would be ridiculous. Uh, the other team might get more baskets that way, too, and the officials wouldn't allow it. Uh, if uh, the army went to war, say back in Civil War, and the uh, Union forces said, we're going to all put on gray uniforms like the Confederate forces, then they won't know if we're them or they're us, and uh, everybody end up shooting the wrong people. Uh, no, you have to know the difference between one side and the other side. And the problem nowadays is you can't tell the difference between the people that are supposed to be on God's side and the people that are supposed to be on the world's side, particularly if they're all using the same kind of music. Instead of feelings and emotions, we should fill our ears and our heart with godly music, not worldly music. We should please the Holy Spirit, not our old carnal nature. It makes a difference. And in your life, in your home, it will show up in the level of Christian maturity what kind of music you listen to. Let's bow in prayer. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the joy of the wonderful music you've allowed us to have and enjoy. Lord, pray that we might not thrive on the music of the old sinful world and give us the discernment to know the difference and to use music that will glorify you and please you. And so help us to understand that. Pray for each parent in their homes that they would see to it that good music is listened to there. We pray for each young person. They might have the discernment to see there's no advantage Nothing to be gained by filling their souls with the music of the carnal world. Lord, help us to have discernment and to please you in this matter. We ask your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen.